Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. Enjoy the podcast. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Have you checked out their latest releases? Use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order. Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Good evening and welcome to The Late Show on Teachers Talk Radio. This is our last live X space um, before the Easter break. So if you are listening live tonight or listening back, a very happy Easter wherever you are. Over to Hannah. Good evening. I'm I'm one of the ones that's still going. I've I've got till end of Thursday, and we're teaching on Thursday. Two more days here as well. <laughs> Although I just rapidly panicked that I found out my son's school is not open on Thursday, so uh, <laughs> I've now got to work that one out. Fun times. Well, my, one of my mentee um, has got a job for September um, in Leicestershire, and is starting on the twenty seventh of August. That's really early. But um, I looked to see when they'd break up and it I said the 8th of July and I thought, you lucky buddy, you're getting a good... I can say that, can't I? Um, you're, getting <laughs> good, you're, get, you're getting a good summer break there if you're breaking up and you've got three weeks off in July. Um, that will be That's very lucky. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, you know, we're in Nottinghamshire here and we break up on the sh- stupidest um, day in July. Are you the 20, 27th, 28th of July or something like that? Oh, I'm quite early this year. I'm the 19th, so Ooh. I'm not too bad on the other end. Lucky you. Lucky <laughs> you. But we do get the two weeks in October. makes all the difference. Anyway, Hannah, I'm going to let Tom in and I'll let you crack on. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So thank you for those of us joining us tonight. If you're on your holidays, I hope you're enjoying it and it started well. And if you are uh, still going, I feel the pain and only you're almost there. Um, just to remind everyone that tonight's show is brought in partnership with uh, John Cat Educational. Uh, they are publishing professional development books and resources to support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. So make sure you check out the latest releases, including the one we're talking about tonight. And you can use the code JCTTR2324 for 20% off your order as well. So don't miss out. Make sure you pop over to johncatbookshop.com and have a look at the full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. So happy reading. Um, so thank you so much, Tom for joining me tonight um, on yet another uh, release that seems to already have amazing reviews across the board. So uh, thank you so much for coming in and chatting to me about it today. Have we got you? (laughs) So those of you that don't know or um, have only just found out that Tom's released another book. His newest one uh, in the Learning Walkthrough series is all about students and parents. So it's kind of linking um, those together and giving them an idea about how to learn. Um, and it's not just about how how they learn, but also kind of in the classroom and at home and kind of studying and things as well. Are you able to hear me, Tom? I Brilliant. can hear you. Can you yes, hear me? yes, you're all connected. Um, can I, so how did this kind of come about, this this book? Because um, it, it's slightly different from the others in terms of the fact that it's focused more towards student and parents. Partly it's because uh, we were asked about it. So uh, over the last couple of years, when we've released the, the teaching walkthroughs books, some schools were saying, well, have you got something that we can share in assembly or give to our students? And some schools actually showed us that they had started to make their own walkthroughs uh, for, you know, it, explaining how to revise at home and that sort of thing. So we thought, well, should we, let's look at that. And then once we once we realised that we had just tons of material, we just thought, yeah, let's do it. So, yeah, but it was kind of came via suggestions from teachers in schools feeling they would it would be helpful 
Well, it's, it, thank you. It is very helpful, um, certainly. Um, did you? I'm curious. Did you alter the language much when you decided that it was going to be for students and parents as opposed to kind of teachers um, reading it? A bit, yeah. I mean, I, I, I had in mind a certain age group of students and even I, I, I remember having these conversations with students myself as a teacher and a, and a head teacher and thinking, you know, if I was addressing this to them, uh, without patronising them and, and treating them, you know, tr trying to treat them like grown ups who, who should be able to understand some of this stuff. So I, I, I had in mind a kind of, I guess, a kind of year eight student who's quite keen, thinking like, I want to tell you about what it's like to learn and, and what, what's happening to you. And so that's the kind of approach I took, sort of imagining the student and thinking, how would they engage with the ideas? But always being careful to not make it sound too childish no and that's the thing and, and you've got Oliver on it again who's got the most beautiful graphics and I think as a as a child it's quite nice to have those kind of go alongside and kind of take them through step by step and, and make it visual as well can you tell I'm an art teacher I love the graphics <laughs> well actually that's it was Oliver, Oliver's uh, the, the driving force behind the whole concept of the walkthroughs in the first place being a visual guide rather than just text and the idea that you sort of can engage with ideas a bit more fully if you're able to visualize yourself doing them and and there's lots of reasons for the graphics being there uh, and it's not just illustrate it's not just to make it look nice it, it has a kind of function in terms of making you imagine yourself doing the thing that's depicted and, 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 and breaking up your kind of thought process as you read the text. So we always say this, that the, the book would be a lot poorer if, if it just had the text and quite hard to follow if it only had the graphics. So it, you need both. It's all about the perfect combination. Um, and, it, and it kind of starts with how we learn. So it's kind of breaking it, it down for them. Um, and I think this is the thing, as, as parents as well, we kind of want to know how you kind of get students engaged with learning and, and, and doing that kind of thing. Um, but how did you come? So I found like the, this first chapter, I found really, really interesting. There are lots of bits that I picked out as, as kind of things that I like. Um, but what made you kind of decide on the myths and weaknesses that you picked? Because I feel like there could have been quite a lot in there. Um, but there's they're quite... Um, a range but they're very very precise well yeah i mean we could have spent ages just on each of the bits the whole nature of the walkthroughs books is that they're a sort of a, a summary of, of a much wider thing to explore so we're just kind of hinting at specific things now the one on myths and weaknesses written by sarah cottingham so one of the features of the learning walkthroughs book is that we we enlisted the support of some proper experts and Sarah Cotting had, wrote a couple of them and one of them myths and weaknesses we offered we offered her a selection and she she picked that she said oh I really like to do that one so she sort of touches on learning styles we don't want to make a big play about that but she basically just the, the, the headline for that one is forget about learning styles which I think is quite good and he just sort of then she kind of explains why but then what's the other ones intelligence isn't fixed that's an important one because Rather than getting into the whole language about growth mindset, we thought that was a bit of a minefield. So we just went for that. And then retrieving beats rereading is there because it's one of the most common mistakes students make is they just keep grazing over their notes over and over again without actually trying to re re generate things. Spacing your study, don't cram it and focus, don't multitask. So th those are the other ones. She just went for a range of things which kind of covered a, a broad spectrum of things but yeah that it's just a sort of you know if you if you're talking to a, a student who's like in year eight or year nine or doing their GCSEs what would be the main messages you'd want to give them and you just want to it's like a summary of a much wider field but I think it's quite a good selection yeah I, spe I specifically love the intelligence isn't fixed because I'm very much I feel like if I if I set a student's 
aspirations is really high that they can rise themselves up and reach it as opposed to um, kind of if you think they're only going to get to a certain point, that's all they're going to get to. So I like the idea that you have to challenge yourself and kind of keep that learning. And and that's kind of goes with this whole book, doesn't it? That they're kind of thinking about how they're going to do it. But you've got some amazing um, authors within it because you've got Pep as well. Um, and how, how did you decide who was going to come in on this book and, and kind of which ones they were going to do? Well, we, we decided the content first because uh, we thought, you know, that's that's how our process is, just to sort of scope out the whole book in one of the sections and then, OK, what's in each section? And it took a, you know, a while of sort of faffing around with that. And then we thought, OK, now, who's the best person to write about motivation and habits? Peps McRae, you know, it's just, it's it's a sort of, you know, he's written one of the most succinct and punchy books about uh, habit motivation. And, you know, we just asked him, we said, do you, fa- do you fancy having a go? And he went, oh my gosh, yeah. So he, it was sort of, and then who's a really good person to talk about how uh, children learned uh, in the early years, so to inform parents. Uh, and Emma Turner is fantastic on that. She's written a whole book about cognitive science as it applies to primary and you know so we just we just asked people now the writing one was interesting because we we talked to christopher such about the about reading and he felt that he, he could do that up to a point but then when it got to sort of like secondary level writing he would be and we we, we thought that the best person for that would be jenny webb because she's written a be- beautiful book about writing and blogs about it and I've interviewed her about her writing uh, approaches. So we thought, wow, if we could get Chris and Jenny to do like a kind of half each of this section. Now they totally took to it. And what was great about both of them is that they they really owned it. They just said, I think we should, I, I suggested some, but they both said, yeah, I don't know, would these be better kind of thing? And they both said, they just decided the things they thought they should write about and offered more than we even asked them for so the the writing section dare i say is worth it's it's, it could probably be a a section a book all by itself it's that good i think it's great yeah i completely agree the writing section is 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 really strong and it's and it is it's just so accessible for the students but going back to the kind of the first one you said about motivation because i think that is something that every parent really wants to kind of crack isn't it how do you motivate your child and how do you but I think it's really important that they learn how to motivate themselves and I think if they can if they can crack that you can kind of crack um everything but it, it's nice that there's kind of like little things it's, it's not kind of like you said it's not patronizing but there's things like do it with your friends and and kind of making it fun and doing it with other people and kind of make it a habit and and kind of if they can build themselves up and do these things early then it kind of they get better at it um so it's it's for me do you do you find that there's one the thing that stands out in terms of motivating children or do you find that it kind of crosses quite a lot of it or is it once they crack motivation everything else kind of falls into place well i feel like in general terms, it's a sort of a virtuous circle you get into of success fueling motivation, and that's linked to some longer term goals. Uh, and it's got to be at some level in, enjoyable or, or in rewarding in itself, but that feeling of achieving something. So, I, you know, you have to think of things that you've ever that were tough, but you motivated to, to, to push through, like, you know, getting fit or something like that. Or learning a musical instrument you know while it's in that spot of if i put effort in and that leads to me feeling like i'm doing better then you're motivated to carry on putting in the effort as soon as the kind of the balance of effort to reward gets in the wrong place you start thinking oh is it worth it and then sure enough your motivation drops and then you actually stop doing so well so as you get into a downward spiral so i feel like that's the general thing and perhaps has done a really good job here of sort of i don't know relating to I think there's one thing about patronising kids. It's, it's no point pretending that they don't have feelings or that uh, the, these things are just everyone does them or you can't tell them a lie. But at the same time, you're not sort of saying, oh, don't worry, you'll be fine. You need to say, no, acknowledge your emotions, but but you do want to do well, don't you? So here are some things that work. Try this. Do it with friends. might not work for everybody, but it, 
it can be a motivating thing to have that collective support. And this is all based on Pepsi's sort of research around motivation. So doing things with other people, knowing that you're not alone, does have a motivational aspect. Yeah, so I, and that links to the habits section. The motivation and habits sort of go back to back. I, I think it's great. And I, I actually think for a lot of children, there's there's not many places they could read about this stuff that's aimed at them. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that students who do get a chance to read those sections will think, oh, that's great. That's talking my language. Um, that's me sitting there trying to study and they're talking about me and they find it useful. I think it's exactly that. There isn't a place for them. I, I try to explain to my tutees the concept of atomic habits and how to like if they prep for their day and maybe put their uniform out the night before maybe they'll feel more motivated to get up and come to school if they're struggling with attendance and things and kind of breaking down those barriers but it's it is trying to get it into a language where they can kind of comprehend it and they feel that it it works for them um I think is really important and and something that I've definitely felt over the last year or so as a general theme on all the shows where I've had lots of different teachers on they've spoken about how since Covid children aren't necessarily as resilient as they used to be they're not as uh, confident in making mistakes and and failing they'd rather not try and then they've got an excuse they know that they they can't fail because they haven't tried Um, and they've got that kind of excuse in themselves rather than kind of finding that motivation building those habits and giving it a go but also kind of having that safety net and those coping mechanisms of how what to do if they do kind of fail. Um, have you have you seen that at all in your experience? I bet. I mean, I, it's definitely the case because I, I visit lots of schools, and there's no doubt that this sort of thing of is reported continually, sort of since COVID. I mean, I, I wonder sometimes. It, it, you know, it feels sometimes a bit anecdotal, but it doesn't really matter. It, it, it's the sense that, yes, you can see it in the evidence of, say, attendance data. That's probably the best indicator that probably we've lost. We've, we've, had, we've had a setback in that regard. But it's it's always that the, the solution isn't to chase the, the, the fringes, really. I think it's to kind of make the core practice more secure because you never know if you're going to win with any individual case all you can really do is just you know make school a place you want to be and and to teach as well as possible so that children do feel they're doing well and but I thought I think there's an honesty in, in some of the stuff in here like Pepsi is saying one of the habit form thing is just show up I love that just don't worry about being good just be there have a go and that, that's true like you know if, it, if you if you've got a put together an art portfolio in GCSE art over two years don't worry about how brilliant it is at any point just keep drawing keep thinking keep sketching keep and it's just, and that's true of lots of performance things where and I, th- I think that's just brilliant advice you know it's almost like a self-help book for, for me I'm thinking yeah good good point Pets. <laughs> but um I, I love that you know just show up and then you know if you do well a finish is reward that thing of like reward yourself to so treat yourself and so there's things in here which would would be in in a, not out of place in an adult book of, about the similar themes, but of course then it links into the the wider stuff about cognitive science and classrooms and all the stuff that follows on. So I hope it I hope it's helpful to people. I think it's come at a right time um, in, in terms of those children, and like you said, it is that showing up is just half the battle I think they they say that about the gym isn't it that half the battle is just going through the door of the gym and then you're fine and I think sometimes it's like that for school just turning up giving it a go and I always say that with my students I'd rather you just try and actually you get more marks in art if you fail and then review it and then improve it that's going to get you more marks so actually you learn through your failures and that's really important but in terms of their health, there's an, an, an this this for me I is probably one of my favourite pages. I'm probably going to say that a lot though, to be fair. Um, the the shed method, which I'd never ever heard of, but I practiced myself. Um, through uh, it was a PT that said these are the th- pillars that kind of you need to focus on, and I have no idea how to transfer that to students. Um, but it's so important that the sleep, hydration, 
exercise and diet and then kind of the the looking after your shed and looking after yourself and I I I think there's so many especially again I'm going back to COVID but I think a lot of kids got into gaming and staying up late and it's become this habit that they're not necessarily understanding how important sleep is and and quite regularly kids will be like oh I was up till this time of night and I was up till this time of night and they don't sleep so they're not kind of looking after themselves and then there's that knock-on effect and it's something that's quite simple sleep you'd like to think it's simple but sometimes it's more complicated but it it can have a real knock-on effect especially on children well, again, I, this is one of my, I, I love having this in here because it is like treating kids like adults. Like, you, let's be explicit about this. It's like we're not going to lecture you about about your diet, but you, we're trying to say, like, you have to take responsibility for it. And Sarah Milne wrote, who wrote it, she she used to be, uh, I, 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 I worked with her at Holland Park School uh, back in the 90s. And we've known each other for years. And she has gone on to be uh, someone who works in lots of different work ways with you know business leaders and CEOs and art artists and stuff around you know in a sort of coaching role she runs a coaching uh, company and one of her things is this shed method she comes across this all the time with adults that if you're not looking after your your health so many other things fall apart and yeah and, and, and sleep hydration exercise diet the shed it's it's great so if it's look after your shed it's so neat and, and gosh, we've, we've all taught kids who are just sort of bleary eyed or, you know, unfit like, and, and, and that kind of energy that gets drained into sort of, you know, fitness isn't something you're necessarily responsible for, which I say teaching physics, but encouraging children in a school to to be fit is so important and a balanced diet and the hydration thing i mean that's been through various loops of, of of research and you don't need to have a bottle of water on your desk and sip through it you know at any minute your body can hydrate quite quickly you know after a period of not having to have, have water on your desk but in general over the 24 hours being hydrated is really important so you have to you know find a way that works and i just think it's really helpful to make students aware of these things and, you know, a nice fresh glass of water. Everyone feels better for that. <laughs> it's so obvious, isn't it? But in a book where you're trying to cover lots of bases and make people think around, you know, their whole experience as a, as a learner, it's so important to have that in there. And I, I was aware of this book, which is written for adults, The Shed Method, uh, through knowing Sarah. So I asked her if she would. And she's done workshops in schools. So I asked her to write it, and she she just <laughs> I've got to condense the whole book into five little paragraphs. So I think it's quite a challenge, but I think she did a fantastic job. But I guess that's what the, the the kids can then go and learn more about it if they want to, or the teachers themselves. But I, like I had um, a three hour catering exam the other day, and I told the kids I'm like, right, all fill up your water bottles, make sure you're drinking throughout, and they're like, what are you want about miss? And I was like, trust me like your hydration is going to be what's going to get you through this exam and um they just don't necessarily think of it as so important and I've recently changed jobs and I've been forgetting to fill up my water bottle and then I'm like oh I'm really thirsty and I instantly notice how it kind of affects my attention and my focus so I can only imagine it's very similar with the children and like you said the exercise is really important I like the the phrase that uh, no problem gets worse from a walk and just even something so simple as that <laughs> and I say to my students if you're stressed go and have a little yeah. walk after school and you'll feel a bit better and, and de-stress and it doesn't have to be vigorous exercise but sometimes just moving your body can just make a real difference yeah and I think that's the thing it's it's not some kind of weird sort of voodoo science this stuff is all all pretty uh, it's common sense in one level, but I think being explicit about it in a context of a healthy, you know, healthy mind and body and so on, I think is is just really sensible. As one of the several things that that the readers of this book might look at, some of some of them they're just thinking, yeah, that sleep. I've got this book telling me I should think about sleep and it's important. Um, and you know, one of the tips in there, obviously, obvious things like. It's sort of suggesting what people have done to improve their sleep. I switch off all devices an hour before I go to bed. Or our WhatsApp group agreed a bedtime and we take it in turns to say when it's time to sign off. You think, you know, I don't know how many students have that discipline, but 
they're probably keeping each other awake through little alerts way too late and just just prompting them to think about that is, is probably as much as you can hope to do I, I told my tutor group that for their when they're revising for their mocks I said they need to have like a phone amnesty because they don't want to have FOMO that they're missing out on the group chat and I was like right you've all got to say right from this time to this time none of us are messaging we're all studying and then when we finish we can all chat about it but then that way you're all not on your phones at the same time you're not worried that you're missing out on everybody else's chat and they were like oh actually that's not a bad idea miss um but it, it's just kind of making them think about it isn't it in a different way um and but it's it's, it's not just those kind of introductory habits that they can kind of change it then goes on to kind of in the classroom uh, which I think every teacher will love because it's like it is those bits where it's like we really it's how to be the perfect pupil isn't it essentially well the, the, into the classroom I, I'm thinking this is one of the, the main original prompts for the book was you know do you have you know walkthroughs on you know these techniques because if again if, if suddenly the, the, the teachers have done their CPD and they're all starting to use whiteboards or suddenly there's this whole sort of wave of think pair share every lesson you know, because what happens with 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 kids that they i remember doing a show me boards in a training session at, uh in a previous school it's about 10 years or more but and we introduced them we bought them and you, you you'd be teaching and you'd say right get your boards out and the kids would go oh no not again. <laughs> because, because like the sort of they thought it was just going to be a passing phase that and and i th i feel this is it's really useful to say to students that this is what your teachers are trying to do that this is the reason why and having a few questioning techniques in there but also there's something about having an external voice sort of nagging you to do the right thing rather than always being your teacher so if they read this book and it says something like something really functional like how to make the most of your exercise book or to more or less say pay attention in class <laughs> i feel like that could be you know, this is why this is why you need to listen and think and there's a logic to it it's going to benefit you what this is why you should follow the worked examples so uh, we've selected things which are very common everyday things they're going to do all the time at school pretty much every week and thought well let's just, just discuss them so scaffolds and various various things so uh, it, again it's pretty uh prosaic stuff it's it's not rocket science we're not saying here's some cool new things to to do when you're at school it's just really down to earth uh, and and that's kind of the, the the spirit of it and I, I think it is I think like we we say to teachers don't we if you understand the research then you um, are more likely to buy in you're more likely to get all the staff on board with it and essentially it's kind of almost doing it for the students and kind of treating them in the same way like this is this is the reason your teachers are teaching you in this way and this is what how it's going to benefit you and this is how it's going to help you learn and rather than us being like we just know better <laughs> this it's kind of yeah. bringing them in on the secret as to why we're doing what we're doing yeah exactly and, and sort of saying to them you know it we're, we're working this ourselves you know we're, we're we're trying to understand how to support you to learn and if you're conscious of the reason why we're saying it, it's going to help you to engage and, and sort of support me to support you uh, but it's informed by the research the, the how we learn stuff at the beginning and I, I also feel like because it's a book that comes into a school from outside some students will think oh this isn't just my teacher telling me this is like or well, sort of like this is the kind of accepted position on this so one of the one of those i think is a useful important one as an example is the one called learning versus task completion in other words yeah don't just don't just um you know copy the table you've got to be able to understand what you've written in the table and don't just label the diagram be able to label the diagram whenever you want to because you know what what the labels are is it so what is the learning that you're trying to get from the task and be really aware of that so, so then you can check if you have that learning rather than saying i finished my work i finished my work <laughs> and you've copied out a table that you don't understand it's that it, that's the kind of spirit of that section yeah that was literally the page that i'm on because i i picked that up as is i'm um, i find that sometimes with students especially like we do a lot of recall and then um if they then have a quiz or something and the question isn't quite exactly the same 
they're so used to kind of they can do the recall stuff like almost blind they're so used to doing it they can recall that information yeah. but then if you slightly change the goalposts and then they because they haven't engaged with the whole task they're then like oh actually yeah. no how do i what how do i do i don't know that i don't know that i was like you do you're just not thinking about how to kind of transfer it and i think that's such an important thing there seems to be t- kids are quite task orientated and kind of ticking it off and getting it done but actually how much are they actually engaging in it is is a really interesting concept it's, it's unbelievable how um I, I i think there are certain things which are more likely to uh, feel like this than others for example anything which a task involves completing a table where there's like 15 boxes or something and it feels like a lot to do and then you you listen to what the kids are saying when they're doing it they're saying oh, i'll just put this you know i just wrote that you know or that just copy that out that that's a good answer and they're sort of they're just getting it done and and if you, and you sort of cover it up or just close it and say okay so let me just check with you why have you chosen that one or what did you put there they just look at you like what you mean you expected me to understand to know it like and, and they haven't even pitched themselves high enough to think I actually need to understand this and, and make the connection in my head before I've written it down. And maybe that's not their fault. Of course, it's the part of the, the structure of the task, but it's sort of nudging them to think, do I, do I know it? Uh, so, that, you know, lots of lots of repeated phrases throughout the book about checking your understanding. Do you understand it? So I, I'm a big believer in developing students agency around this sort of thing. So that their capacity to say is it right is it finished is it good enough do i know it you know how well do i know it do i know it well enough is my writing sophisticated enough is my composition complex enough and they need to be the one kind of deciding that for, first and foremost and so training them up to think in that self-critical way about what they've done and their performance and their knowledge i think it's a kind of a theme i think that weaves its way through this book I like that. I'm very much like you've done the task, but is that the best you can do with that task? Like, do you need to work back into it? There's a lot refinement, I think, is really important for them to kind of grasp in terms of the kind of in the classroom specifically. How would you recommend using the book? Um, Emily's asked whether you um, is it more kind of student led or would you expect them to kind of do it in form times or in, in class or a whole school thing? How do you kind of envision it being used? There are a number of different ways. I feel like at one level, it, students who are interested in this stuff will read it and they'll be interested to read it. One of the things that we're making available to the walkthroughs, people people who basically get our stuff in their school for teachers on the website, that they'll have access to slides and videos. So there'll be a video uh, you know, by the by, the end of this term, no, by the end of the summer term, there'll be a video of me explaining each of them, so they can listen to that. But also, there's slides. So schools might say, "Let's do an assembly about common features of lessons," and they'll be able to run through some slides and then narrate them themselves. And so the, the kids are seeing their own teachers discussing it. So that's so the resources that support the book might be one of the ways. But in terms of the book as a book. It depends. It depends. I mean, as, a, as an author of a book, you can never sort of say, wouldn't it be great if every child had their own copy and you sort of read it through together? <laughs> you know, that would be that one way. But it, it could just be that you, you know, the teachers select parts and, you know, I don't know, photocopy bits out or just engage the class in a discussion about the idea and encourage them to take the book out of the library or whatever. And if there's so many different ways, the main demand for us from schools has been for sort of, slideshow type resources to use in assemblies that's originally and then to have sort of reminders to put in uh you know planners and stuff like that so the book will be the origin of those but they'll probably be morphed into all sorts of different forms no i like that my my school have like a, a form time reading where they have to listen to my lovely dulcet tones um reading different books but i kind of like the idea that we could all read this together I feel like they would although they it's really nice to expose them to different texts that they wouldn't normally read I feel this is kind of more beneficial that they could actually take and then do something with it 
um, which I think is is kind of I guess I guess it's the point that teachers can deliver it they can kind of take it on board and then it should improve their kind of education because it's it, but again it's very much how much they take on board and how much they do and it is is do you do you feel that this is accessible to like the lower end of students that might struggle um as opposed to I know you said you, you had that kind of year eight really bright student that wanted to engage in their learning but do you think it can help the lower end as well I think so but I feel like obviously some children will need more guidance to engage in the text and, and it's it, it's not a book you read cover to cover it's not like a, a gripping yarn from <laughs> start to finish you, you, it's it's designed to be something you read one section at a time and in, in, in any order so there's no the order is kind of just nominal really really we just sort of thought we've got to put something in, in some order but really each page stands on its own so you'd encourage people to read just one bit and, then re and probably a lot of kids would it would be a case of reading it together maybe re reading it to them and then saying right so what what does that mean for you like always applying it to them and i can imagine as a tutor saying focusing on and on, on a particular thing at any, at any point and saying so let's have a think about that what 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 does that mean for you what does that make you think you need to do and it's like a, a tool for self-reflection a bit like the walkthroughs are for teachers they're, they're not like rules you must follow there here's an idea for a technique do you do this does that help for you how how successfully do you do that bit and do you think that's a good idea and it sort of prompts and nudges and we feel this is doing the same hopefully for, for children but I mean, the book, as a child, there's, there's two levels. There's, there's a kind of lower end in the sense of kind of, I guess, what you might call attainment level, that type of view and reading confidence. But there's also age as well. So we, we're well aware that as the younger the children get and you're, then you're trying to tell them about how you read, you know, <laughs> there's a, a level below which the kids are too young to read about how they learn to read so at that point we switch the language and start addressing it to the parents so there's a bit of it which is almost we know that the reason we're writing the book is because the parents will have it and they'll be uh, running through it at home with their kids and, and even though it's written to the students that it's really for the parents to own it and so it's a bit of a fudge in that sense it, it... we did think about yeah should it be a separate book for parents and we just thought, oh my gosh, it's, we don't even know how we would achieve that. So we thought we'd just do the same book and then know that the parents would be savvy enough to read the read the walkthroughs knowing that it's addressed to the students, but for their interest as well. Yeah, it's, it's so like you could see it as two books, but then it's how they would work together and what child wants to sit there and kind of do books together because it, I think it's, it's, it's certainly something for GCSE students as well like that are going into that exam kind of heavy hitting independent revision kind of area and how kind of teach, uh, parents can support their child with that process um, is good as well but in terms of because with, with all the walkthroughs you, I find myself that you pick the ones that kind of you use and you are good at and you have like a repertoire is how I like to think or my library of, of different pedagogies that I use that I know work for me I know I can do other pedagogies and I can pull them in and I can use them but there's a, like a set that I know that I'm really good at and I do well and they I kind of sit within my comfort zone sometimes with those do you think that there's some in here that kids would be drawn more to and also do you think there's like a limit on kind of the num or what is a good number to kind of be able to master in order to be able to kind of improve your learning or is it kind of that thing of you master this number and then you add in a couple more strategies and add in a couple more yeah i mean i think it's i think it's a slight different i, I think there's a slight difference with the with students because it's a long term game i mean these walkthroughs will will sort of they, they'll encounter them at a pace which is sort of the, the pace of a of a year or two years you know and, and so you might there might be times in that year where I need to do revision so the, the study at home techniques will be more relevant other times where they're doing a project and, and a, or they've got an assignment to complete and they want to do well so they might look up, look up things to do with that so there'll be phases whereas teachers are, are more sort of like you said selecting but what we found is that 
you know, we, we so for example, where, where, where the walkthroughs we work with, well, now thousands of different schools, and, and when they share with us their selection of techniques, these are our sort of core techniques in our school. It's, it's rare to find two the same. I mean, it, it, you, you get every school has its sort of twist, or every teacher has their sort of selection and, I, and that would be like you say that some children who might be say more performance orientated they might be doing a lot more things where you have to perform and get evaluate the quality of the performance and improve it that, that they might be doing more of that or be more interested in that so a lot of the walkthroughs around you know improving performance whereas others might be much more into kind of <coughs> the retrieval practice type quizzy knowledge type based things and want to be hot on that and of course you know ultimately some students will, will need to engage in both of those types of things but I'm sure some students you say well some things will resonate and they go oh, that's that's cool I, I need to think about that a bit more but I, I think to be honest it is probably initially the 70 there's over 70 techniques you can it's a lot to take in at one go so it's the sort of book you can have around and dip in and out of and it will kind of hopefully add up to a, an understanding of learning over time and it, yeah and it, it there's there's so much in it that the kids can take from it it's, it's just really interesting and um, the the next kind of section is that the feedback and improvements and i find it really interesting that you start with the success criteria and i i i'm quite a success criteria kind of person i know that it's it's one of those that some people kind of phasing it out. I don't know whether it's necessarily as as popular as it used to be, but I always did um, a thing at my very first year seven lesson where I tell my kids to draw a house and I give them one minute and then I'm like, right, if you've got a window, you've got five points. If you've got a chimney, you've got 10 points. And then I'm like, but if your chimney has smoke coming out of it, it's minus 20 points. And if you do a tree, it's, it's <laughs> minus 50 points. And if you use a ruler, that's plus 100 points. And they're like, this is so unfair. And I was like, but if I told you to use a ruler and you were going to get 100 points, you'd have used the ruler, wouldn't you? And they're like, yeah. And it was just kind of, it was a real clicky moment. I'm like, this is when I tell you what I'm looking for that's to help you so you need to kind of digest that and work out how you can put that into your work in order to kind of uh, succeed if you don't kind of take that criteria in then you're going to be throwing away easy marks and I think it's that that kind of a little bit of exam practice as well in terms of looking understanding what a question is asking you and what a teacher is asking you in order to be able to uh, react in the correct way um so I was, I was like oh yes it's first I like that <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm a big fan of, of success criteria, but in, in, in our walkthrough and for teachers on success criteria, the first step of it is examine exemplars of different standards. So you don't start by giving the kids, here's a list of what you must do. You start by saying, here's a couple of pieces of work and one of them is better than the other. Which, which, was, which is better than the other? What do you think? And then why do you think it's better? Or what is it about it? Why is that this idea of quality? What does, what does better mean? And then you can start drilling down into, okay, so you know, better writing has these features, and then you can look at a whole range. Oh, this is a good good piece of art. This, this, this art sort of process has been more successful than this one, and what did they do? So then you can say, okay, so if we're saying that's more successful, it's got this, it's got this, it's got this, it's got this, and the features of it then emerge from the comparison. And, and that to me is important. So Starting with, when you're talking about feedback, you've got to be feeding back around a sense of quality, around a sense of standards. So establishing what the standards are needs to come first before you start telling, giving feedback. So I feel like that's a, that's true for teachers. So it should be true for students. So we start with saying, what are the success criteria based on your analysis of some examples, and then produce work with that criteria in mind, just like you said. So don't don't be, don't just guess and then retrospectively go did i do it you say no i need to include this i need it to be like this um yeah so then it, it says use criteria to evaluate your own work and there are two types of, i this is comes this is actually borrowed from the school of physicians with it i thought they had this brilliant um way of doing success criteria for students they had things you can tick and on one side and then on the other side it said um 
things that make it good and that, that and those are different so things things you can tick is like does it have does it have three paragraphs at least does it have a full stop and a capital letter um for every sentence does it have at least three of the words of the week that i've asked you to include in your writing so that kind of thing so they're, they're definitely tangible things i can tick yes 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 no and is it good as a whole quality so that's like regardless of the things that you've ticked is just what why is it as good as the other examples and why it's a much more subtle evaluation but i love the way they made that explicit so we've i've tried to do that so use criteria to evaluate your work checklisting is one method and the other one is quality judgment the second method and it's they, they are subtly different uh, when you're trying to explain that to students but it it, it does help them think in those two different ways and i, and I don't know hopefully that'll be useful and it flows really well into the exemplars in terms of getting students to look at a piece of work and being able to work out what is different about theirs that work to theirs and how they get to there um it's just so important i think in terms of their learning to be able to raise those aspirations and get to that next step it's just such a key part before they can do the improving yeah exactly i know i think there's a well, it's kind of well documented in, in, in some of the work of, say, the, the formative assessment world, but knowing what you're aiming at in terms of quality is, is key. So if I had a really, I had an interesting discussion with my son who's at university in his final year, final year, so he's been there for four years, and he says he still sort of has this feeling that when he's writing an essay, he's sort of just doing his best, but he doesn't really know exactly what would make it. And he, he, he's written essays, he, he would say, oh, that his essay is way better than that one, in his opinion. And then when he gets the marks back, they're the other way around, that type of thing. So it's sort of confounding the sense of what is the standard exactly? How am I supposed to know? And I feel like that, such an, a, a, a creative idea to get into is, so we always say to them, well, have you seen, have you ever asked them to show you essays that got like, you know, 70% or 80%? Um, and the answer is no. <laughs> you know, he's sort of guessing. Yeah. So you, you... I'm doing my masters at the moment, <laughs> and I am doing exactly the same thing. Where it's just yeah. kind of guessing and hoping that you you feel like I'm like, oh, that one's better. Wasn't better. Um, it's it's yeah, and it's that we've got one example, but they don't even tell us what grade it is, and it's about a hospital. So what around? Got to apply this to education. Um, but it's it's yeah. interesting. It's it's getting yourself out of that comfort zone and pushing yourself. And then I learn about how I learn, and then I'm more sympathetic for students. Um, you've got study habits and techniques in there. I'm curious, what was your kind of study technique when you were doing your exams when you were a child? Did you have like a favourite revision technique? Oh gosh, I, to be honest, it's just going to sound bad, but I I used to be quite good at exams. <laughs> so I, to, I I kind of I used to do a lot, before I kind of knew why I was doing it. I didn't really have a kind of meta sense of it, but I I used to test myself a lot, um, do lots of lots of practice questions, and um, do lots of um, you know writing out whole sets of ideas and then checking if I missed anything out you know so I, I had good sort of retrievable knowledge but mostly it's lots of practice questions so I, I, and be very on on the big picture so our first first one starts with getting the big picture I used to be a, a totally nerdy about knowing exactly what was on the exam and what did I need to know and did I know it yet and which bits so haven't I covered and sort of like being quite forensic about oh man, there's a whole topic, I don't know it well enough, and zooming in. So I've always felt like that thing of starting with a kind of overview of what is required in this whole course is really important so that you, you can gauge how much effort to put into the bits you don't know. And also just feeling that sense of pro progression through. So as you, if you know the whole course outline at the beginning, you can get a sense of how far, you're, how far you've got and what there is left to do and you have to sort of pace and self-regulate your effort and that, that sort of thing. So I was, I always used to do that and it, it seemed to pay off, but I, I've always tried to encourage my students to do that. You know, my, my first couple of lessons with a new exam class is very, you know, 
or, or any course, even like a year seven class, would be saying, well, what are we, this is what we're going to do this year. You know, let's have a look at the whole year. This is where we're going to do. We've got these units ahead. And so you get a sense of where we're going, a sense of direction. And I think that helps kids pitch their, you know, their, their process. And also it involves them in the, in the conversation. They're not just sort of turning up to one random lesson after another and saying, what, what's happening to me today, you know, without any sense. They, they know where they're going. They know what they did last lesson, where you're aiming over the next few weeks, and they have that, they're, they're part of the flow. So I've always felt that was really important to me. And so I've tried to do that in my teaching and, and sort of through, through this sort of book, communicate that, take ownership, you know, tell the students, it's your exam, not mine. <laughs> you know, the subtext in the book is, it's your exam. It's not the teacher's exam. You're the one that has to sit it. So do these things if you want to do well. And there's a kind of, that's why we try not to be patronised. We're saying that you can develop agency. You can take ownership of this thing. It's not just, you're not just on the receiving end of it. No, I completely agree. And I, I've, I work with some low attenders or kids that struggle to get into school and they've, some of them have really struggled with the mocks. And I'm like, just go in and do it. Don't leave anything blank. Just write something for anything, even if it doesn't make sense. But it's whatever pops in your head when you read that question then you'll know where your blanks are. You've got to use this as an exercise to work out what you, is you, very deep inside and you do know you just don't necessarily have the confidence and where your big gaps are, where you've got to go back. And it is kind of making them not afraid to kind of give it a go. I think it's really important. Um, but I, uh, my, your next section is your, your reading and writing, which we kind of touched upon earlier is beautifully written. And I was discussing it with my friend who's head of English and she was like, oh, this is brilliant. But I'm going to I'm going to say that from all teachers everywhere, that the best page is the writing letters and emails page. Um, we had a whole head of department meeting at my old school where we said, can we please make sure our kids know how to write professional emails and, and don't just write rants and go, sir, you're really unfair for giving me this detention that they've actually I'd respect them a little bit more if they actually worded it politely and put across their argument as to why they didn't actually deserve it rather than kind of just having a rant that they they need to know the etiquette of kind of how to use it in life I think because I think it's such a skill like um you've got job application letters complaint letters uh thank you letters professional emails and how to sign off um my new school does a lovely thing where they they write thank you letters to the teachers every now and then and I think that's lovely and just that process of being reflective and knowing how to do the nice things as well as the complaint letter. But I love the fact the complaint letter is in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, it's great. So there's something, you know, Jenny Webb is just superb and all this stuff. And she's obviously had this experience as a teacher herself and teaching English in her language. You know, there, there's a kind of, a lot of there to do with writing, uh, Related to literature, but this whole thing of writing in, in English as a the English language grammar and so on, building off from punctuation, writing with purpose. One of the purposes is clearly the the, the, the stuff about letters and emails. So it it feels really sensible to have stuff in there and explain it. The difference between yours faithfully and yours sincerely, or yours or whatever. Yeah, I I, I think it's great. They have something quite functionally practical in there and detailed amongst the kind of wider con concepts, the kind of abstract concepts. And it's partly the, the success of this chapter that made me think, and we might talk about this in a minute maybe, but that we should mention other subjects as well, because having a very, the book originally just had generic stuff about learning and it didn't have any subject in there. And we were just thinking, you need to sort of show show that this applies to actual content and and Jenny's thing about English essentially English language writing I just thought was great so I thought yeah let, let's do more of that um she was it's like one of the quickest turnarounds she had like she said like, I said can you do like f five or six she said I could do eight <laughs> because she couldn't she couldn't squeeze it her ideas into six so she wrote eight of them and then she turned around in like no time whatsoever is absolutely epic using her own tips and her own work <laughs> yeah 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 um but I, I, we exactly. can skip to that one so the last chapter like you said is is kind of learning and subjects so you kind of give examples we've got 
art, geography, history, languages, literature, maths, performing arts, uh, physical education, science and technology. So it's like you've you've covered a real range of, of subjects, but it's like you said, it's nice to see the practical application, but I almost feel like they could be individual mini books themselves and kind of go into that kind of almost like a, a more modern version of the revision guide, essentially. Well, I mean, we, we, we were thinking there's a real danger here that, you know, you, it, ha, is it even meaningful to have a two page summary of a subject? And I've already had some people say, you know, you should have included this or you didn't mention that or anything. OK, so what's the purpose of it? The purpose of it is if you flicking through a, a book about learning, cognitive science, how to study, and it doesn't mention any of the stuff you actually are going to learn, it feels a bit so so abstract so we wanted to say so when you flick through all of these 10 areas together that what, what it shows you is boy you're going to have to learn in a whole range of ways so school is quite broad and that was the, the main thinking that it, each each page on its own isn't really the, the, the thing it's the students are going to go through okay so in art i kind of do this geography it's more you know there's this thing called like a case study or there are some things to think about in, in languages. I, you know, so that each subject has quite specific modes of study. And that's the point, that you have to apply the techniques to the subject and think, how do I get better at languages? Well, you have to practice speaking and listening. You don't have to practice speaking and listening in geography or in art. It, it's different. I mean, you might in the lessons, but not as part of the assessment. It's not one of the fundamentals, etc. So if trying to get... The, Ideally, that's what the impact would be. The, the students think, yeah, OK, so I'm, I'm studying this. So this is the way I need to f study. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do well in art, so I need to think about these things. Yeah, so, you know, we, we did a bit of drafting, sampling, sent them to schools with real actual teachers who would look at them and tell us what they thought. And we, we got some feedback about things to add and change. and. So we did run it through it by some expert people. So it wasn't just like Tom's view of how to teach art. That would be like a bit risky. <laughs> I'm sure it would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I had some of the ideas because my daughter did art GCSE and she got, an, uh, she got a, you know, a grade nine. And so I knew what it looked like from a yeah, parent's point of view. hard work. See <laughs> nine, crazy. Exactly. Well, right. you don't, you don't, you don't start in year 11 no. for a start, you know. But this thing of, um, you know, the, the sketchbook and uh, the portfolio, it's, just, it's, it's a different mode of assessment, a portfolio assessment. It doesn't truly happen in most other subjects, so it's important to know, uh, to know a bit about that. But also it's the idea of exploring artists as well as developing techniques, everything. So we, we, that, that's the spirit of the, of the, uh, subject section that you're you're hoping by reading through them you'll be thinking yeah I do need to think about appropriate technique and mode of learning for subjects and for parents reading it they'll be thinking yeah but then for some of them they'll be like oh gosh that's interesting I didn't that's that's that makes me understand a bit more about what you do in languages and maybe you know literature baths whatever it's one of those as well. It gives you, as a parent, those little things, those little prompt things to ask them about. I remember my friend wrote yeah. post-it notes and stuck them all over the house and would, uh, like, if she opened the fridge, she'd ask her son the question on the fridge or if she got something out of the cupboard, she'd ask him the question on the cupboard. And it's like it started this dialogue that he had to kind of answer about. But she got them from, like, going through the revision books and working out a couple of key things that she could quiz him on but not knowing the subjects um themselves um if, if you are enjoying the show thank you for everyone who's listening in live do feel to, free to comment any questions you have and if you are enjoying the show and you're like oh i really want to get my hands on this book it is available at john cat educational um don't forget as well if you use the code jcttr2324 you can get 20 percent off your order so uh, pop over to johncatbookshop.com and you can ha find it there along with the the rest of the range over there at John Cat. Um, if we pop back one section, um, we've got then the um, 
independent learning, which I really like. I I think this is key. Like if you can crack independent learning, then you're going to be all right kind of after school. I feel like you're going to fly at college and in uni and things like that. But it goes quite detailed, like Cornell notes and kind of references. I don't think I learned till much later on, but actually they're quite good skills to master when you're younger. Yeah, and, and again, we thought for for any any student who's got as far as this bit of the book, we you sort of start thinking, how, you know, how much more generic stuff can they can they really relate to? So we thought canal notes and referencing were very specific, but again, in a way, there's a kind of subtext which to this, which is that you might not follow this in detail now while you're reading it but be aware of it you know there is a there are there are some established protocols around note making which you might want to look at and find useful even if you don't specifically do it now and the same with referencing there's a sort of attempt to say you know don't just copy stuff off the internet <laughs> just citations and, and referencing it's all sort of saying that we, we expect you to eventually be interested in academic referencing there's a kind of aspirational aspect in that so there's lots of reasons to include it, but also some of them, and that one in particular was a request. So we had some teachers saying to us, it would really help. They just thought that would be helpful. So we thought, okay, well, if even one teacher thinks that's helpful, we'll do it. Uh, and so I think that was the origin of that. I don't think that was my idea to have references in there, but it was suggested and once it was suggested, we thought, yeah, let's go for that. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm even like, oh, I love the fact that it's in there. It's that page rather than me having to Google and remind myself which one is which. It's great. Um, but like you said, it, it does build in those kind of key skills, like like independent research tasks, how to do that properly without kind of just copying and pasting off the Internet and how to kind of really think about it and understand what you're finding information wise and put it um, properly. But then also, like, I think one of the best things that students can learn to do is like giving a presentation and that can be really really scary like although I'm an art teacher I've got a student that I has with the attendance that I've been working with who did her English speaking presentation with me because she was I was the most person that she was most comfortable with to do it and it was like I talked her through some of the steps beforehand of kind of this is what we need you kind of need to think about before you actually give the presentation and kind of but just you, and she did so well. I'm so proud of her. Um, but it is those little things that if, if you go into that situation having not practiced and have not thought about the skills you need to be able to do it well, then you are going to struggle. Well, exactly. And I think there's, there are some things which I, I've seen over the years at school um, where you just think, oh my God, this is absolutely dire. And it's. <laughs> The teacher has this great idea that we're going to do class presentations, but the kind of undercooks the uh, the discussion about how to do it well. So you you end up sort of enduring ten absolutely atrocious presentations, <laughs> and you sort of you're halfway through them and you're thinking, oh man, we've got another five to go, and you think like let's let's be uh, and that, let's any anything you do you can do well or badly, right? So giving a presentation who's it for it's not just for you to say i've done a presentation a presentation is for the audience listening to you so you have to th this idea that you think about telling a story and then engaging the audience and so on and also that you rehearse that you practice so it, it, there's a sense of standards in in, in in implicit in that which is do it well you know tell a story know your stuff and engage the audience make it interesting for them and obviously some kids find that hard but at least they're trying rather than read out your slides from your powerpoint and bore the pants up everyone you know sort of yeah so i feel like it's quite a common thing to see in schools and because it doesn't happen very often so you don't do presentations a lot and which means the practice rate is low which means they tend to be sort of serial mediocrity rather than great and i and i, th I think that's one of the sort of pitfalls of occasional activities in schools like a group task or a presentation that because you don't do them enough to, to think it's worth really investing time in talking about how to do them well, you end up then being a bit bit of a low quality thing. I think they're fantastic. I mean, some of the 
best things that when I think of great things I've seen in schools, I've, I can just scan uh, memory banks of students standing up and explaining stuff beautifully and in a moving way or a very interesting way or just in a very smart way. You think, wow, that was good because they thought about it. They rehearsed. They took it seriously. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things I, I feel like is the tone of the book is as the author talking to you as the reader, I take you seriously. I, I believe that you can do really well at school and you should do well at school, but I'm not going to talk down to you or, or say, you know, I, I, I'm going to say, but I'm also going to be slightly demanding of you because I think that's kind of OK to do that as a teacher. But I, I think you're spot on. I think as, especially with presentations, for, for me, I, well, I did my first master's in textiles and I had to we got given a brief once a week and then the next week we had to present it and then we got critiqued on it. And I was a very nervous person. I hated standing up and presenting in front of people. And I... It was doing that and standing up in front of a group of 10 people and presenting my idea week after week. But I think by the end of it, it clocked that I wanted to become a teacher and actually I could stand up in front of 30 people and present. And also there's something, we know that oracy works, we know the theory behind it, but ha having that conversation and saying those facts out loud just makes such a difference in kind of the answers that they give, but also embedding it. And it's it's building that confidence, isn't it? And especially with kind of COVID and communicating. I think the kids aren't necessarily as strong at doing that. And it is, it's a skill that we need to kind of put back in. And I think, uh, I, yeah, so I'm a big fan of that section. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've seen some beautiful stuff recently. One of my favourite uh, in that area, one of them was a school um, where they did this, they, they, they did a, some projects from the international primary curriculum, which has a kind of a set of units for say humanities like ancient civilizations and they have this thing called an exit exit point to the project and the exit point is usually or often a kind of market stall where the students will showcase what they've learned and parents come in and, and see it and so that you know, i saw the exit point for this unit and uh, i think they were year fives and they were just standing by their display and you could just go up to any group of kids and they would tell you all about what they learned. It was just magnificent. So they're, they're telling you all about how Romans built roads. And I thought it was brilliant. And they, they'd obviously done it several times because that's the beauty of it. Multiple people walked around. And so they had a quite low stakes conversation with just a few people gathered around at any one time. So it wasn't like addressing a massive room. And so also they were getting better and better at explaining because by the time they, I was going around, they probably explained it to 10 other people already. And, I thought it was fantastic, just a brilliant idea. And there's so much good that came out of that. They had, they knew they were going to do that in the end, so they had it to work towards. So it was a kind of high stakes thing to you've got to really know your stuff because when we have to present to the parents, you know, that kind of thing. But also just the joy of it, you know, that, that hearing kids talk out, out loud about the knowledge that they've gathered and their enthusiasm. What's not to like about that? Say, I love that <laughs> idea. I'm going to nick that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we we have yeah. had a question from jo, Juan. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, he says, happily enough, teachers and school leaders are demanding evidence-informed teaching, but to what extent do you think families and students demand it or understand its importance? I don't know um, if, if 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 you said to parents, you know, in a meeting, would you would you want your child's education to be evidence-informed or based on? their hunches and guesses they probably say uh, we'd like it to be evidence informed but I, I sort of feel as if like most, you know, most parents you know, have busy lives don't they so and they trust schools to do the, the the job of schools and so I think the most interested and engaged parents who are really into this stuff are, would be interested in fact I've done this stuff before I've done parents workshops and I always find the parents who, who volunteer to t attend really interested. I mean, they really are. Um, but I feel like, you know, and sometimes when you're when you're making a change, so I know some schools where they've introduced, say, cold calling, uh, and it's been a change. You know, we're not hands up anymore. As a default, we're, the teacher will select who to ask so that everyone has to think. And you have to sometimes explain that to parents and say that we're not just sort of saying, I don't want to, 
Because if, you, if you've been a kid who benefited from the hands-up culture and always got picked, and now you have to wait till you're asked, because other children are getting some airtime for a change, you know, that's a bit of a shock. And if your parents haven't had that explained, my daughter says she's not allowed to put her hand up anymore. What's all that about, you know? And you think, well, maybe giving them the rationale and giving them the opportunity to engage in the reason is, is really helpful. And, and I think that's generally true of things like study habits, Let's explain to parents when you're getting your kid to study. Don't just don't be happy if they're just there staring into a folder, you know, because that's not really the best way to learn. They're not going to be learning very much if all they're doing is grazing and flicking through the pages of their notes. Get them, see them writing stuff down, testing themselves, checking their knowledge, and ask them about that. So I guess the better prepared parents are, the the, the more support they can be. How demanding of schools they would be, it, 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 it depends. I, I think they will be demanding if you make a change and they don't know why. Um, and I guess that's often, often where these things arise. But I'd, I'd love this. In fact, I'm going to a school in May where they've asked me to do a parent workshop. Um, and I've been there before. And the last time I went, like 100 parents turned up. It's like, oh, my God, you really do care about this stuff. And they loved it. That was about things like that was about teacher coaching. They wanted to know about teacher coaching. The school just had this culture of we inform our parents on what happens in school, and they, they, the coaching was all over their newsletters. So they they thought, well, I was there. Do you want to come and do a workshop for parents? And you know, so the next one I'm doing is about this learning learning walkthroughs. But then um, I think. It, Offering that to parents is, is a great thing. And I guess more and more now you might capitalise on the skills we've all learned during COVID of doing them remotely. You, know, do you, you don't have to do it in the school hall. You can just sort of do a webinar or a teacher they recognise presenting them about what's happening at school. You could do that type of thing. Do you, do you have like um, any tips for schools for getting parent buy-in uh, and getting them engaged in something like this? I, 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 well, I, what I can do is say is, is what I used to do, and, and I, I felt, I mean, God knows, I mean, I made plenty of mistakes, but one of the things I used to feel I did reasonably well was getting parents in for things, and one of the things is to make it re uh, routine and predictable, and run multiple sessions regularly so that the parents know that they always are there, and then you talk about what the content will be. So there's this sort of parents forum type thing and I, and I feel like that's a really useful thing to do to say you know there's always a parents forum every term and this this term we're going to be focusing on this with homework or revision or you know change in sex ed policy or whatever it is and they know there's a regularity to it so it's they, they become familiar and, and then once they know other people go and, and to attach that sometimes to um other times when they might have to be there anyway, so running them before a parents' evening or, or, a, or, or whatever. So, but mainly it's just make it a part of the fabric of the way you do things. Even and, and be really happy if only five people come because you think, well, okay, at least it's five, <laughs> and then we can build from there, rather than those five people being made to feel like they're the weird ones. You know, it's like I've, I've had that. You should be really happy. Um, with, rather than sort of expressing your disappointment that other people didn't turn up as well, you just think, oh, well done, thanks for being here, it's brilliant. And, and you just think, well, you're the ones here, I'm going to help you. Wider than that, I think you just have to make the information available and parents will, will graze it, you know, in their own time. So things like recording sessions so they can be accessed remotely, short things rather than long things, all those sorts of things. No one, no one watches a half hour video. No, they don't, they just don't. They'll watch a five minute video um, and maybe read something to follow up if they're interested. So short, punchy, that type of thing. No, that's great. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish with what I think is one of the really useful sections is what to do when you're stuck. Because I think this is something that children, <laughs> they're like, I'm stuck and I'm just going to give up. And, and it's like, I think they're really great tips for kind of when things get too difficult or when they don't understand and how to get through those barriers. I think that's just such a good life skill for them. Yeah, so I'll tell people what it says. So 
if there are five things, there are different scenarios. So each one is a, it's not a five step guide. It's more like five different ways you might feel that you're stuck. So one of them is if you don't understand. And I always think this is true for teachers as well to think about it. If someone doesn't understand something, you have to go back to what they do understand. So you've got to think, well, where, where, did, I, where did I lose this? And what do I know? So you're encouraging the students to think, well, we'll go back. What, what was the last thing you felt you were secure with? And then let's just hone in on the bit where it, where it went a bit fuzzy for you. So it could be like rereading notes to check that. Did you understand them? You know, sometimes you make notes that you don't fully understand at the time, but you go back over them and can I make sense of it now? And of course, what looking at worked examples. And of course, it doesn't just say ask somebody. So that thing is you do all those other things first, but then encouraging kids to say, well, ask, asking someone to re reteach you is useful. So I think that's the first thing is that it's quite normal to not understand things, but go back to the solid ground. The second one is if you don't know where how to start, that's a very common thing with that blank page. It's daunting, you know, how do I get, how do I start my composition? How do I start my story, my essay, the maths problem? And it's that idea that you kind of just sort of sketch ideas, you start doing something, you start sketching, jotting, writing things you know, and kind of you'll get your world, your brain thinking through and then it starts emerging, it's that, that, that type of idea. The next one, if there seems to be too much to learn, so you're just overwhelmed by the mass of it. And as Peps McRae writes in his section at the beginning, how do you eat an elephant <laughs> one bite at a time? You know, you just just got to get going. So it's about breaking it into chunks. Sort of, don't try to tackle the whole thing. Just chunk it up, bit at a time, prioritize. If you find it too difficult, it's a bit like if you don't understand, but I, the, the image here is piano. And that is because that was a kind of suggestion of mine that if you're trying to play a piano piece that is just constantly too hard for you, it can be very demotivating. You just think, oh, I'm rubbish at the piano. So what you do is you just you know go back to playing ones you can play and feeling good about, I can play this and practice that. And then you sort of just push yourself in that direction, in that just that spot between what I can do and what's a bit too hard, rather than it's way too hard. Sometimes you just try to make a jump that's way too big for yourself. So go back to solid ground and build up. And the last one is, if you feel like you've fallen behind, which is a horrible feeling, you've got to get a sense of catching up, being reasonably doable, rather than you're just so far behind, what's the point? And so many people suffer that, adults suffer that. You know, it's, I'm, I've, it's pointless now because it's all over. So there you have to kind of get a sense of, of the total thing you need to do and, and map your own plan. So you, you forget about what everyone else's timeline is. You've just got to create your own and say, is it, how would I get to the end from here? Well, and, and, and work out what that might be like. So it's sort of, anyway, again, they're, they're all just prompts and, and nudges. And hopefully by including them, they're sort of recognising these are things which, we wouldn't have put them in the book if lots of people didn't have these issues. So you're not alone. If any of these things apply to you, there'll be tons of other people that apply to it as well. And it's just a normal part of a learning experience that sometimes it feels it's too much, that it's too hard, that you've fallen behind. And, um, and I'm trying to learn French at the moment and I, with a tutor online, and I feel the same about it every time. So I'm just like, this is, I'm, thinking, I'm reading this going, yeah, good, good tip for myself for my next lesson. I love that. I, I feel like as teachers, we all secretly love education and we all keep learning in some kind of weird and wonderful way. So <laughs> I love the fact you're learning French. Um, just a reminder that if you've enjoyed tonight's show, uh, if you've missed any of it, you can listen back uh, at Teachers Talk Radio or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Um, it will be available uh, shortly to listen to. But also you can go get your book from John Cat Educational um, you can use our special Teacher Talk Radio code, which is JCTTR2324, and get 20% off your order. And I, I highly recommend it, not, not only if, if in terms of like for your students uh, and to promote it with like your parents, but for you to have a read through as well. Because it kind of, for me, it was reminding myself how students learn and what it was like to be the student on the, on the learning side. I've already t I've told my students that I'm like, um, well, they've got to start revising for their mocks. So if any of them want to borrow it and have a little read, they can do. So 
I'm hope and a few of them were like, oh yeah, I quite fancy that. So I'm hoping that it will kind of um, motivate them to take their learning into their own hands and and kind of really engage with it. But it's beautifully written and obviously beautiful graphics as well from Oliver. But thank you so much for coming and chatting and talking it through with us as well. It's just been great talking to you. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really honoured that you asked me and I, I enjoyed talking it through. I, I really appreciate your engagement with it. I, 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 that means a lot to me. Thank you so much. And hopefully everyone's enjoying their Easter holidays. If like me and um, HB, you're still going two more days, you can make it. We're almost there. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys their chocolate when they get there. So thank you so much for listening. And thank you, Tom, so much for joining us. And enjoy the weekend when it gets here, everybody. Thank you. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.